Thich Nhat Hanh says that Buddhists、uh, drop the idea of taking a view, taking a position. Guanzo says, Guanzo, another Taoist philosopher, says those who argue miss the point. It's great, and, 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 and I, I, I've always interpreted him to say that if you get involved in agonistic forms of conversation or in academic disputes,、mm-hmm. you are, from his point of view, missing the point. Hello, and、uh, welcome to everybody. Welcome to the third episode、uh, in the series Three Books with my guest.、Uh, my guest today is. Andrew Taggart. So let me provide a brief introduction to you, and then、uh, we'll start speaking together. Andrew Taggart is a is a philosopher, and、uh, you know sometimes to give somebody a compliment, you have to be careful not to offend other people, and this is one of those instances. So I want to say I have the urge to describe Andrew as a real philosopher, and I want to say that he's one of the few real philosophers among the philosophers that I've met, because、uh, he is. I feel like he's on a philosophical path. And not just on a career path. He is also an,、uh, an entrepreneur, and he has、uh, described himself as, a, among other things, as a non-dualist and as a seasonal nomad. And I think that description, the self-description, non-dualist, is important.、Uh, my impression is that it is different from describing、uh, oneself as a monist, because a monist is just a monist, but a non-dualist is. Not a, a not a monist, which is to, is to say, is like a creative double negation. The Hegelian creative double negation.、Uh, he is the Andrew. He is a, 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 the founder of an organization called Ascole. If I am pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I want to ask you about the meaning of that word. The, the way yeah, it comes from. Of course. And、uh, he has written、uh, many books and articles. And I want to, in, in keeping with the spirit of the series. I'll mention only three titles that I really like.、Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the three titles of his books. One is called "A Guidebook for Philosophical Life."、Uh, a second is called "The Art of Inquiry," and the third one, "Cultivating Discipline Lightly," which is、mm-hmm. such a beautiful title.、Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so before、uh, you share with us the three titles of the books that you have selected,、uh, please say a few things about Ascole. The, the of course, yes. Well, I can tell. So, a scole it comes from the, the ancient Greek term "scole,"、uh, which is transliterated in a few different ways. And I'll tell you why I transliterated "ascole" in the way that I did in a moment. It's a bit of a joke.、Um, "Scole" refers to、uh, contemplation or leisure. And according to、uh, Joseph Pieper, then this was the primary term that. Aristocrats would have used the cultivation of, of leisure,、mm-hmm. contemplative leisure. So I started an agency or a way of、uh, working with small、uh, tech groups. And the, the joke that I try to keep in mind is is, is, the, is the, the, the inside joke is that it's called ascole, which means withdraw from the primary term we call leisure into the realm of work. <clears throat> right. So it's it's a placeholder for an understanding of what it is that I think is primary in life,、right. and what I think is secondary in life. I see. And、so、then, then there's a long. It, it would take a while to un- unpack that, but there's a long set of arguments I've made about the nature of total work in the journey. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, a, a, another way to this, a, a, another brief way of introducing、yeah. you is would be to say a, a, the critic of total work. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the that critic of a work dispensation that's been going on for at least five hundred years now, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I see. Anyways, it's great to have you、uh, yeah, as, as my guest today. Thank you. So,、uh, please,、uh, could you th- th- share the three titles? Yes, the the first one is a book that is near and dear to my heart since I was quite young. That is Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Uh, the second is a book that was very formative、uh, for me as I went off on the philosophical path, and that book is called "The Present Alone Is Our Happiness,"、mm-hmm. which consists of these very beautiful interviews with the late French philosopher Pierre Ardo.、Mm-hmm. The third book is the one that may, brings us to the present, you might say, <laughs> It brings us into non-duality,、mm-hmm. and that book is the Tao Te Ching,、mm-hmm. attributed to Lao Tzu, someone we might call Lao Tzu.、Mm-hmm. I see. Great. I was、uh, surprised with your first selection, <laughs>、uh, and it was 
but it was the selection that motivated me to go and read the book. Yeah. Because uh, as I've already said, it is, uh, I had prejudice against the, the book. I thought, oh, I know already what's happening in it. But I, I was very pleasantly surprised to read and uh, spend a few days reading it. And I really enjoyed it. Did you, I was, did you finish the book? Yeah, yeah, I finished oh, it. Oh, wow. It's, it's quite a page turner. I think readers might not know that that is the case. Yes, yes. And, and I think it might help. To, to know that Jane Austen in the popular imagination is seen as this writer on romantic love. And that's the way the movies tend to look, I think. And there's mm-hmm. a, actually a group of people called Janeites, who are those mm-hmm. who do discuss and think about Jane Austen novels and movies in these rather sentimental terms. But you actually read the novels, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, Emma, and so forth. You find that these are pretty rigorous philosophical disquisitions on human behavior, human nature, social mores, mm. and above all, I think, moral and intellectual development over the course of these novels. Yes, yes. So what's really interesting, I think, is that we, we might be inclined to think that, um, if, 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 if viewers don't know this, that, that one of the main characters named Elizabeth is prejudicial, and the other main character named Darcy is filled with pride. Mm. So we have these allegorical, um, types, you might say. But that's not quite an accurate reading. It's rather the case that it's owing to my own pride, which is what you're experiencing days mm-hmm. prior to reading it, that I'm prejudiced. So yes. it is an amazingly un- good understanding for you of, of psychology, right? I'm, it's my presumption of having known that this is just going to be a flowery tale uh, of, of, you know, with, not, with not any real uh, uh, substance mm-hmm. that I can rule it out from the beginning. And so that's exactly what she's looking at, among many other things, in this novel. How, how it's the case that from a psychological, moral point of view, we actually continue to do that. Mm. Our, our own lack of Socratic understanding, pride, is the condition of possibility for our ongoing misinterpreted judgments of others. It's, right. it's an amazingly insightful starting point, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, the pride prejudice, uh, the, the pride fool prejudice, which keeps us at a distance from uh, the things that we can get to know. And, yes. uh, and in turn, those things will allow us to, by virtue of being open to them, uh, evolve. Mm-hmm. So it's that, that blocking the contact, not entering into uh, contact with uh, people or works of art. We actually keep ourselves fixated. Uh, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you, I, I agree with you. He's, actually, she is targeting that uh, prejudice, that experience that we can apply to the book, also. And he, I think, uh, she, uh, Jane Austen, uh, implicitly uh, answers the question of what it means to be human. Mm-hmm. And the the image, uh, I think, and let me know what you think about this. The, the image that she uh, provides is an image of a person and uh, people, individuals, as trajectories. Mm-hmm. Trajectories that uh, go through time and they hit each other, they hit uh, culture, cultural norms, they hit against expectations, and sometimes and, and they make decisions about what to do with these expectations, what to do with these uh, cultural norms, what to do with the, with the point of view of another person. Mm-hmm. And uh, then they keep going and they keep changing based on these uh, decisions and responses that they, they make. I would agree with that. I would, I would say that what really drew me to this novel in particular around 2010 or so when I revisited it was actually the seminal moment that occurs in the middle of the book. And I think at this point in time, we probably won't be ruining the book to at least talk about that. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, the main character named Elizabeth has received a letter from th- this man that she purports not to like very much. His name is Darcy. Mm-hmm. And he had, I think, at this point, uh, proposed to her completely out of blue. And then he writes and she, she says, no, I, 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 I couldn't possibly. She receives a letter and the letter becomes this incredibly important moment in the novel because it, it's Socratic in nature. She says, till now, this is the famous line, at least for me, till now I never knew myself. Mm. She reads the letter and it involves an extraordinary uh, amount of self-critique, uh, self-assessment, 
moral appraisals and the like, I would say this is A, a moment of shame, and B, a moment of humbling the heart and the intellect. And the reason I bring that up is that that, that to me is is, is, is is, is, is a rupture in the trajectories you're talking about. We do bump into one another and we have conversations and we adjust our expectations and our, our modes of access. So we, we tweak and revise and iterate and such. But there are also these moments in our lives that are ruptures. Hmm. And I've experienced that myself. So I know what it's like to notice that my trajectory wasn't really, whichever way it was going, it was going this way. And now it goes a, a very different way if I take it very seriously. I've tended to call those existential openings. So she has this amazing existential opening and it allows her to not only humble her own heart so she's less prideful, not only open herself up to others so she's less prejudicial, mm -hmm. but also reassess the people in her life from a very different point of view. Mm -hmm. For example, she used to think that, um, his name Wickham, I think, yes, I can, confusing with Willoughby in another book of hers. Mm. She used to think Wickham was this very charming, noble, intelligent fellow, and it, it becomes clear to her that that's not even remotely the case, owing a key part to this letter, but then to her own uh, reconfigured moral and intellectual perceptions. She pays closer attention to him and doesn't, and, and doesn't, um, doesn't neglect the blind spots or the things that she had passed over before. Mm. She pays attention to, to her memory, memory of him, and even that is enough to... Yes to provide a turning point. Yes. Yeah, the, the letter was, for me, also be, became a very, one of the most significant uh, places in the book. And uh, your description, I, if I say it in a different way, the letter uh, enabled her to become present to, to many things, including her family. And up to that point, before reading the letter with her uh, in the book, I, one of the characters that I admired completely without any ambiguity was uh, the father, Mr. Bennett. Okay. But the, the, the letter casts a doubt, ca casts a, an ambiguous a light, even on the father. And she becomes present to her family and some of the shortcomings that any family has, sh some shortcomings. She becomes aware of it. And that's part of their uh, humility that she has to now adopt after being he, present. Certainly. Um, and and <clears throat> her, her, mother, her, her mother had hitherto been seen as this med meddlesome, overly officious person, and that's still true, but we also have to bear in mind that it comes to a degree from care. She wants to make sure that her, her daughters are well married because that's going to ensure that they have, a, some, they have financial stability. Mm -hmm. Whereas the father is, is erudite and ironic, but he's also checked out. Right. We see that more and more. He, he, he seems to be unwilling to be helpful, mm -hmm. at least even in the, in, in the simple ways of decorum in most cases. So. It's, you can really nicely read, as, as it happened before, Jane Austen as an incredibly good person when it comes to moral education. She's showing, to use Aristotelian terms, where we have excesses and where we have defects. The, the father's ironism ends up being a way of shielding himself from the, the, the hurly-burly of social interactions. I know that because I myself have tended to be rather ascetic. It would be nice just to sit in the library mm. and to be learned and mm -hmm. to be away from the messy affairs of the world. Right. And it's easy to say that the mother is just a kind of um, flighty, um, overly cooing, overbearing, mm -hmm. suffocating creature. It's, mm -hmm. it's very easy. And you'll find that that's also true in other, other novels, such as Sense and Sensibility. Mm -hmm. But it's not quite accurate. You have to sort of sink down and realize that notwithstanding her officiousness, she actually does care about her daughters and is proactive on that score. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to yeah. ask, uh, ask you a, a question or two about uh, the book. And, you know, we, we don't have to be, you don't have, we don't have to give voice to Jane Austen's own perspective. Just that uh, I'd like to know your impression, your, your thoughts on, on uh, these, these questions. The first one um, is a question about why she, does she include five sisters in the family? Because uh, the Bennett family has, uh, has, well, aside from the parents, there are uh, four sisters. And throughout the novel, three of these five, so, sorry, five sisters, three of these five sisters, they have some kind of uh, narrative, uh, dramatic 
the flow attached to them. So that some things happen to them and they, they go through ups and downs and then they settle. But there are two sisters that are, they have a quiet, relatively background uh, life against the, the rest of the pot, which like it, it brought this question to my mind. Why didn't she just choose to have three sisters in, in, the, in the structure of it? Because that's a, that was a decision on her part. Yeah. She could have just said, oh, this is the Bennett family and they had three daughters. Yeah. But she didn't do that. She, she gave them five, five children, yeah. five daughters. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, the first thing is I don't know how many daughters were common to have at this time. I'm not, I'm not a historian of, of English social history in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. But I suspect it was fairly realistic. So that's oh, one. Nice. That's one element. So we'll just we'll, we'll allow that. That's not the interesting answer to your question. <laughs> now, uh, listeners or viewers might not know that, that. I'll just try to. It's been about a decade since I've read this novel, so, but I read it many times. <laughs> we have two two main character sisters. One named Elizabeth, and she is <clears throat> most interesting. She she's the one who has undertakes sophisticated moral and intellectual development. We find that to be true in other Jane Austen novels as well. Mm. The second daughter, uh, who's in many respects akin to Elizabeth, is named Jane. Jane is, I wouldn't say Pollyannish, but she's, she, she's always look at the bright side of life. You know? <laughs> she, she's, she, she's, she's, she, her, her, her moral considerations are a little bit too, too much bathed in, in a certain optimism or mm -hmm they're a little bit naive. She's a little bit naive. And we realize that over the course of the novel, she's too willing to give, she's too willing to fudge. That's her moral defect. Mm. She fudges on people's character defects. Mm. Or we can, we can also, my mother's say, like that. Yes. Yes. We can also say she has a very strict moral compass. She yes. has a sim simpler, relatively simpler. She's like, yes, principles and, and it makes her decisions simpler. Exactly. That's true. Yeah. Those are the, Two, two, two main female characters in the novel. Mm -hmm. Then I believe there are two, uh, Lydia perhaps and Kitty, is that right? There, there, then there are two that are um, kind of gossipy and bubbly and they're socialites. Mm -hmm. they, they want to be around attractive men. They want to marry well. It's all very, it's all very much fun and games. I think, I suspect they're being used as for plot device because it's, it's helpful to have two gaily sisters more than to have one. Mm -hmm. um, in order to take interest in the, you know, the attractive military men, the Navy men, and right. things of that sort. The last one is very interesting though. The last one, Mary resembles Mr. Bennett in many respects. Mary is the one who's overly, um, overly erudite. She's a it's kind of a, a certain kind of a snob. Of, mm -hmm. and, and so we, so maybe I can, and, and she ends up being alone and she's, she's, she's someone who's, she's a bit like a, like an English teacher you've had in school. She mm -hmm. tends to correct you on things that are uh, matters of insignificant importance. Like, oh, is it an Oxford comma or a non-Oxford comma? She's that sort of person. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one way of trying to answer the question, why are there five characters, would be to appeal to a really beautiful essay by the late philosopher Gilbert Ryle. He, uh, he was actually a, a, a philosopher of mind. Mm -hmm. So it would be, it's very surprising already that he's reading Jane Austen novels. And indeed, he seems to have relished them. So he, he provides uh, one argument that looks like this. In any Jane Austen novel, what you get is something like a wine tasting approach, he says. You're getting uh, different, you're getting a kind of an experiment, as we might say today, in different combinations, for example, of pride and prejudice, or different, different moral and intellectual qualities that are, that are slightly modulated in each character. Mm. That allows you to com nicely compare Elizabeth to Jane in terms of rigor of thought, willingness to look at blind spots or whatever, whatever relevant criterion you want to use. Mm -hmm. It allows you to look at Lydia and Kitty vis-a-vis -vis Mary and say, oh, they're too carefree, but she's too, uh, she's too earthy. Mm -hmm. And you can see them in greater relief that you need to, to, as it were, adjust the recipe. So let me change my metaphors away from wine tasting recipes. You're starting to see how you might adjust the conditions of each character in order to get some, someone that is really very well morally and intellectually cultivated. Mm -hmm. That's my guess. So if you look at somewhat kind of iterative or pro prototyping terms, you start to launch five characters, give them slightly different, use slightly different recipes and see how they turn out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Uh...
you know, it's, it's, it's going to be clear if you, if you go on and read Science and Sensibility in the future too, because you'll see that according to Ryle, you're starting to see to what degree someone is overly reasonable to the point of being desiccated. And some characters are just slightly too in the realm of the romantic. I'm using German romantic, English romantic terms here. Too, too much in the realm of the, the sensible, oh, what a picturesque scene. And look at the blasted forest. This is just like the Gothic mm-hmm. and so forth. Mm-hmm. You start to see what happens when uh, the characters modulate these qualities. It's, right, right. The contrast. It's between- a whole, a whole, the, whole, the whole world of Jane Austen is, proliferates with people that fall onto this strange spectrum. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so it actually becomes your own form of, if you want to look at it that way, it becomes your own form of moral and intellectual education as you begin to understand yourself vis-a-vis different, co- different combinations of qualities, of the, different combinations of the relevant qualities. Right, right. I understand. Yeah. Um, now, this uh, next question may be a little bit, uh, well, I'll ask it anyways. Okay, uh, go for it. I wonder uh, whether the happy ending is, uh, is an essential feature of this story. Like, w- was it necessary to have a happy ending? Because one of the sisters, well, I, I'm, I apologize for the spoilers. <laughs> but yeah. even, even when something bad happens to a character in the story, it doesn't go too bad. It doesn't go too sour for them. It doesn't become tragic. It doesn't become irreversibly uh, Nobody becomes irreversibly and evil or damaged. I, I wonder if, and, and that was not necessary. She could have created a story where things go wrong. So why do you think that uh, she gave the readers, she gave us a happy ending? I, I, don't, I don't know. I, don't, I think that's a basically a theological question because I think the, it's a comedy of sorts and it's also a theodicy. Mm-hmm. That is, if I may say it that way, it's a way of justifying God's ways to men mm-hmm. and women. There is, there is not just poetic justice, but kind of cosmic justice. Consider Lydia, is it? And Wickham. Yeah. This is a very bad thing. That is, that is a bad ending for them. Yeah. Um, uh, listen, viewers might not know that the, the, the Lydia, who's this flighty, bubbly, uh, everything's okay. She's kind of a cheerleady character, you might say goes off with Wickham, who is seen as the, the, the spoiled, spoiled, spoiled character of the novel. And they, they're in, they go in exile to, I think, to Ireland or Scotland. And this was seen as being, this is, this is an unsavory thing to do. And they, get, they elope, which is a very unsavory thing to do. So we're led to believe that they think, and, and they're, not, they're not doing that well financially, except, except in so far as Darcy and Elizabeth. Darcy is wealthy and Elizabeth helped them, I believe. But this is this is a this is very unsavory. So that is not a comic ending for them. That, that's a case of just desserts. Mm. So I suspect and there's a hypothesis to follow that that she had a belief in just desserts. Mm. That is, people get what they deserve. Mm. That would be a just world. Yeah, Elizabeth and Darcy both go through their own fundamental, and extraordinarily painful moral reckoning to the point at which it's possible for them to come back to each other and come to this, this kind of love that is also a deep friendship, as I said, I said in one of the articles that I wrote, mm-hmm. or the introduction I wrote on this many mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think what you're saying is the possibility that each person would come to, as it were, his or her station in life mm-hmm. and would find the one who is most fit or appropriate mm-hmm. for that person. Now, is it plausible? No, but it is a moral vision of a certain kind. Mm-hmm. Plato had his moral vision in the Republic. So it is, it is a kind of philosophical thought experiment. What would happen if it were the case that the, the people who are able to cultivate themselves in the right way f- are able to find the kind of love that is a form of hap- a genuine happiness? It's very, it's very close to, uh, it feels very Christian to me. It mm-hmm. feels very much like you, you get what you deserve and there is salvation, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So maybe I could riff here and say it's a bit like a soteriology. That is, it's a, it's a, it's or an eschatology. It's, it's a novel that provides us with a view of salvation. What right. would salvation look like? Mm-hmm. Now, for those of us who are accustomed to later modernist and postmodern novels, we might find the, the happy ending itself somewhat unsatisfactory because we might think it's too easy or we might think that we're used to open-endedness or we might think that ambiguity or uh, complexity 
is a proper understanding of the vicissitudes of, of human life. In some respect, it might seem as if it's not a good piece of mimesis. But the question is on what register are we reading it? Are we, registering, are we reading it as something that tracks ordinary life in a way that is, as it were, true to ordinary life? Or are we, are we asking the novel to be some kind of moral vision of how things could be if it were the case that good people actually get what they deserve? Right, right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If we find that naive today, then I think that we should actually ask a question about our, our, our own cynicism. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that each person is going to get what he or she deserves. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that it, it should be possible to imagine a good or beautiful world, especially during the height of the, the COVID pandemic. We, we sh this is a time to open ourselves up to the very possibility that it could be a, a good and beautiful world manifesting itself in hitherto unknown ways. So, you know, AC, I'm, 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 <clears throat> I'm not saying that her, her vision, insofar as it looks a little bit too literal, is, is, is entirely what we're going to be able to draw from. But I do think that there is, at least uh, quite apart from just her, her Christian background, an interest in what it would actually be like if it were the case that, let's say, goodness and beauty were harmonized. That's my that's my riff. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, uh, so I, I saw two different ways of answering that question. Uh, yeah. One was to by uh, making a reference to her not just describing people, individuals, but also presenting a world, presenting a worldview, not how people work, but how the world works, and there's an order in how how the world works, how, or how it ought to how it ought to work, perhaps ought to work. Yeah. And that, that's related to the second way, which is, uh, I really see, I sense that she is, she is aiming to educate the readers. She's aiming to do something that we can call education. She's providing yeah. an educational experience for, for the reader. And that's uh, with the, with the uh, way of encouraging them towards a better life. And that's, in, that's consistent with characters in her novel, in, in her story, enjoying a good life. It's, it's Absol kind of absolutely. Experience. And I think the, the, her novels have touched me for so long because they are providing examples of moral education at the same time that if you are a skillful reader, you yourself may find your sensibility, you're changing, you're being slightly modified. Mm. I'll give you an example uh, from my life that, that illustrates how important this, this book was for me mm. or, or, and her books were for me. I, I fell in love with this woman in 2009, uh, just after moving to New York City, mm. and she was a very beautiful and vibrant woman. I met her at the climbing gym I've been climbing for a number of years, uh, for a number of decades, actually. <clears throat> and, I, uh, and it was just magnetizing. It was a bit like Elizabeth meeting Wickham. Mm. Uh, There's just, a, just such, a, such a magnetism, such, such an arrows, such a vibrancy, such vitality. And, uh, and then I found out that she was going to be in Guatemala uh, for six weeks to do a photography project. At the time I was adjunct teaching at uh, a little Catholic college. I say a little Catholic college. I was going to say a little lower arts school, but it's largely a business school <laughs> at this point. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what if I were to, and, and, and I said, what if I were to come visit you? And she said, that's great. So I canceled all my classes. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I canceled my classes. I had no money at the time and I, I bought a ticket, but it was possible to buy a ticket at that time. This is, as I say, 2009. Mm -hmm. And this is, I should have said, I, to make this sweet, we were actually communicating over Google chat because mm -hmm. things like there wasn't the kind of internet connectivity at that time. So I think I proposed it over, over by that, by that, through that medium. And, and that was after she had already gone. So I'm booking the ticket. Just to clarify, you proposed a trip. Yeah, I proposed a trip. I proposed right. that I visit her at the end, at the very right. end, like last week. Yeah, right. but after she had gone, mm. and while we're communicating, and so right. she's like, right. "Yes, that's be great." And uh, I, I get there, and it, it turns out that she has Gir Girardia, and it's just a dreadful week we have together. After all the ebullience and life of celebration and the the, 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 the glory of falling in love, it was just a, a very terrible, terrible trip indeed. Uh, right, right. So, so you start to notice this, this sort of track a Jane Austen novel. Then we get back and she promptly breaks up with me. I hadn't realized at that time that she's 
without using psychological labels, very up and up, very up, 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 and very down, down to the point of being suicidal after she got back to New York. That would require more details, uh, actually. Uh, but I find myself being a nursemaid for her, at least meeting her, because I'm actually concerned for her own psychological well-being mm. after this. And, and it, it's, it, was, it was a very quick unraveling. Uh, so it was, it was such a fast falling in love, such a, such a surprising event in Guatemala, and then such, a, such an unraveling, and I'm leaving out a lot of details here. The point that, that, that I think Jane also would want us to get to is that we can actually come, as we do in, in the case of Elizabeth's letter, to a, a moral reflection that requires us to turn the question back on ourselves. I call it an introspective question. That's what I did. I remember sitting on a subway train, I think going into or out of Brooklyn after I'm just crestfallen by the demise of this relationship. I mean, I'm just, it's very painful. I hadn't felt that kind of pain. I'd fallen in love twice before this. Uh, I remember thinking, this is the Jane Austen question. Not what's the matter with her, or whatever else. You know, I, could, I could probably uh, understand that well enough at this point. Uh, but rather, what was it that was deficient in my own moral assessment or my own judgment? What, what is it about my faculty of judgment? I'm using that in a neutral sense here. Um, that was so skewed to make me believe that this is someone who is one I could fall in love with and be in love with. That is, what was it about me <laughs> that was so off? Mm. That's a Jane Austenian question. There's moral education right there. Mm -hmm. I know that we've had these, we've, many of us have had these experiences, but it was such a shocking in my face question that I, I, couldn't, I couldn't turn away from it. And it made an extraordinary difference to my life. Mm -hmm. That question, that moment, that 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 pivot. Mm -hmm. It's very. I think that's, her novels are her novels are inaugurating over and over again those kinds of moments. Another one, and I won't ruin it for viewers. A main character falls ill, and I think that these um, melee scenes have tended to be in people's actual lives openings for for moral and intellectual transformation. Um, a genuine melee is a genuine sickness. Genuinely being in your sick bed, mm -hmm. not necessarily knowing what you're whether you'll live uh, or at least knowing that it's pretty serious and knowing that the the choices you've made so far might have been reckless or careless you're you're invited to to do that kind of moral reckoning and that's what i was doing mm. and i think it was thanks to her novels that i was able to learn how to ask those questions of myself mm -hmm. because i'd seen characters ask them ask these questions of themselves many times before mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right this actually brings us to this point the question of what is the task of literature what is the task of, what is the point of reading big novels? They are fiction, they are not about real events, right, but right. The, the way they educate us is that they, in a way they provide spaces in our mind that we can later go to. We, they provide uh, standpoints, possible standpoints that we can go to and then come back from. Mm -hmm. This is a, one of the uh, accomplished achievements of going through an educational process. Because it will be extremely difficult to do it from scratch without having developed those positions to go back to, to travel to and question uh, the situation from that standpoint. Yes. Once we uh, develop th feelings and uh, become attached, not just to a person, but to an interpretation of a relationship, like this mm -hmm. must be like this, like there's no, it, I, I might be wrong, but no, it, it must be, this relationship must work. That kind of attitude, the sure. attachment to, the attachment, not, not just to a person, but to a story with the person mm -hmm. that you just, it must be true. Mm -hmm. That these uh, stories, these works of literature, they, I think they help us, uh, they enable us, to, at least they give us a possibility of being a little bit distant and re-examining, re-examining. Absolutely. And, and it might be helpful to know something that's uh, less often commented upon autobiographical <laughs> uh, fact in my life, and that is that I actually studied English literature and finished a PhD in English literature. It would take a while to unpack how English literature departments are all place, also places where you study continental philosophy. It's, it's a, there's, a, there's a very dense story. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, departments are not natural kinds. They're not divided into discrete areas of, of study. Right, right. So there was a long, there was a long odyssey for me as I went and into an English literature department as I move from the study of literature to the study of literary theory to the study of ethics, history of philosophy, and so on. The reason I bring it up here, though, is that 
uh, conservatives, I think, have a decent point when they claim that certain humanist humanistic departments um, are teaching what well, Ken Wilber would call the green meme. They're, they're teaching certain forms of, of, of consciousness that have to do with um, the, the preeminence of social justice, the preeminence of the question of justice, and the preeminence of certain vocabulary surrounding justice. And I'm actually sympathetic to justice, to be sure. But that's the way we were taught how to read literature. This is, the, this is the important bit. We were taught to read literature in terms of oppression, resistance, in terms of um, those who were uh, perpetrators and those who were victims to a degree. I mean, I don't want to make this into a Jordan Petersonian caricature, and I think he does caricature it to an extreme. I don't think he actually notices the, the important points about social justice. But what I'm trying to get around to saying is that I wasn't actually learning to read literature in the way that we're talking about today. Mm. This is something that I came to, I, I, through, I guess, through older traditional literature, I don't know, or through my own, uh, my own burning desires. Mm. The, the, this reading literature in an earnest way that would allow one to sophisticate, you might say, one's moral education was just not something that was happening in the, in the departments that I was involved in mm -hmm. when I was at the university. This is reading it in this way uh, must have been something that inchoately operated within me for a time and then became explicit after I left academia. Mm -hmm. I this would be seen as, you know, at the time this would be seen as being a little bit naive or it would maybe be a reader response theory or uh, it would lack, um, it wouldn't be doing uh, kind of, a, we wouldn't be making a quote original contribution to the field, whatever that means. This is just not the sort of things that were being discussed. I think it's important to underscore that point because the very hunger we have to come to literature or real philosophy, as you might put it, other things, is, is the hunger that's born of our experiences of being in the world mm. and of finding this rich, extraordinary reservoir of let's call it wisdom, you might say, mm. not to, <laughs> to put it but grandly, and in, in, in these amazing works. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, I'd like to emphasize it. And I completely relate to what you said uh, from my own personal experience. Uh, and it, it's important to emphasize because a few people who have already interacted with me on social media, I have, uh, they have either explicitly or implicitly have conveyed uh, something along the lines of, oh, but I can't really discuss these matters with you because you have a PhD. But that's uh, really, I, I always want to, tell them that having a PhD doesn't mean anything. And it, in fact, if it means anything, it doesn't mean anything positive. Because <laughs> I, I remember also similar to what you said, I remember I, before I was doing a, my doctoral work, I would read very freely and I would read for my own sake. I yeah. would like pick up from the library Freud's interpretation of dreams. Mm -hmm. And I would never have that kind of experience, reading experience uh, for its own sake and with an open mind during those five years. So like those five years, maybe they were like a kind of, kind of an intellectual winter. <laughs> and then once, yeah. once it was finished, then I felt like, oh, how come I didn't read like this during those five years of my PhD? So I had to catch up again. Yeah. It's right. as if I played a role that was not, that was almost inconsistent with the, with the re kind of reading that we value. Yes. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I was, I should also say, concomitant with my being in university and, and, and uh, learning a certain worldview that could be mm -hmm. called um, variously leftist or radical leftists. Mm -hmm. uh, I was also um, undertaking a self, uh, self-directed study. My, my dissertation, which is why <laughs> it didn't get me into academia, was this broad, baggy, and ambitious uh, investigation of the nature of the good life in the modern world. It was, it went into moral philosophy, into history of ideas, mm. into um, literature and beyond. I'm not saying it was good. I'm saying that it was edifying. Mm. It was very important for me that I did ask that question. I did with a kind of earnestness mm -hmm. and without, without care for how, uh, how it would basically make it impossible for me to become an academic mm. at this period of time. Um, mm -hmm. it, was just, it was just that, it was that important. Uh, and, and that's okay. I think if we'd come up, this is not a conversation about academia to be sure, but if we'd come of age at a different time, then I think that would have been a perfectly acceptable mm -hmm. piece to have written. 
there have been times in academia that have been more open, they've been a bit more searching, they've been mm -hmm. a bit more humanistic in nature. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and it's, it's probably okay to me that academia is doing what it's doing just fine. Uh, I've just loved actually being able to philosophize and think and, and, and learn and, and edify myself outside of academia at this point. It's, mm -hmm. it's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. The energy goes to in different places. The, the life force or energy or zeitgeist, whatever, moves in different directions. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. In a way, I, I would say it is in a way relevant to our discussion of Jane Austen because one of the themes in, uh, in this work, at least, is the struggle against convention, struggle against mm -hmm. how things are done and mm -hmm. the process of individuation, how an individual wants to find uh, his or her own path. And some of that might be... Uh, might go against the existing conventions. And, uh, yes, yes, for sure. And, and um, it's especially important to understand uh, is that romantic love has not always been around. That's a recent invention. Mm -hmm. It probably comes a little bit through um, the medieval um, tradition of chivalry. Uh, it's going to be a precursor to what we now think of as romantic love. But I think Jenny Austin should be given a great deal of credit for, or maybe censor, uh, a censure for having helped to invent and proliferate romantic love. Mm -hmm. It requires going, that is to say, at that time against convention up to a point, if it's the case that romantic love is not always congruous with um, the more economic considerations that would be involved in marrying well, as it would be said. Now, it happens that we get a perfect congruence in many of the novels between wealth and happiness or wealth and love. But certainly we can imagine cases in which uh, following your heart, the untrodden path may mean that you're giving up economic security. In fact, that seemed to be the case with Elizabeth in the novel when she was going to be, when um, a, a, a priest or a pastor who was, uh, wanted to, to marry her, he wanted to marry her for completely conventional reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He thought this was the appropriate thing to do. Mm -hmm. And he would have provided her with a fine livelihood. You know, not a not a lavish livelihood, but they would have been secure. Mm -hmm. So that's she cool. has to actually flout that. She has to flout tradition in a mm -hmm. way that's not entirely most well mannered, mm -hmm. in order to 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 realize that her her worth in life was more than that. What she longed for was more than that. Was that she longed for more than that? And one of the other characters I now recall, Mary, is this man completely out of. Um, financial considerations. Like, oh, well, this will be a stable life we'll live. This will be a kind of cozy, we might even say bourgeois life. Mm -hmm. And it was that, and we see that in the novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Any, uh, anything else about Pride and Prejudice before we move to the next book? Or we can? It's just, it's a, it's a beautiful, that one. And it, it, I, I hope we've underscored in this conversation the, the importance of coming to these really, really amazing novels uh, with a fresh open mind and a fresh open heart, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, I also, I second that. Um, even if you have watched the movie, it is still worth <laughs> reading. <laughs> it is enjoyable. It is a, it's a kind of slowness in it. The same, the same kind of slowness where, in which uh, Elizabeth re reads that letter, that's slowing down, taking time. The same thing is, it happens if you give, give the book a chance. Yes. Um, okay, so the second one, I couldn't find a copy of it. Um, and now the delivery, book deliveries don't work anymore. So, but I had uh, a copy of uh, Pierre Hadot's, another book by him, uh, Philosophy as a Way of Life. And he, there's a chapter in, in that book that has that title, uh, The Present Alone. Can uh, The Present Alone is Our Happiness? Something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's right. So I read that chapter. Um, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know how closely related to the sentiment, I guess, is in the, in the title. So the reason, yeah, the reason I selected that book is that it's a nice one for viewers if they're interested in Hondo, about which more in a moment, mm -hmm. it's a good entry point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Pierre Hondo was a, a French philosopher uh, living in the 20th century, the one who died in 2009, I believe. He was very, he was just extraordinarily influential on me. Mm -hmm. He came at a time, and this is a nice way of segging from the first 
part of our conversation to this part, because it was just at the end of my academic life around 2009, just after I'd finished a PhD that I don't know how it happened. I must have been in vain searching <laughs> in, a, in a less algorithmic world then <laughs> on mm. the internet. And I found, I, I somehow found philosophy as a way of life and other, other such works. And I started reading them and they, they are erudite to be sure, but there's a, there's a freshness about them mm. that struck me. There was such, such an earnestness. So it's commonplace that there are two quote unquote disciplines of philosophy today. One is called analytic philosophy. It is that which reigns in the United Kingdom and the United States and Australia. It's more analytical, uh, conceptual, argument heavy, not very broke at all. It's, it's quasi scientific, it could be said, and the style of writing tends to be very much logic heavy. Mm. Okay, that's just a, a characterization of the style. Mm. I would also say that it tends toward topics that are more digestible, you might say, a, a particular subject in epistemology or a particular matter in logic or, or metaethics or whatever. Mm. So it looks very scholarly. It's, it's sort of, it's neat and fit for research, what Heidegger would call kind of the research model uh, of academia. Continental philosophy, which look, consists largely of, of um, French and German philosophy, though sometimes you rope in the Italians here and there, uh, is more Baroque or Rococo. It's a little more avant-garde. It's more free-spirited. It tends, <clears throat> it tends more toward the, the religious and the political. The, the names here that people might know of are Jacques Derrida, or some people will, will include Michel Foucault, and there are others who made their ways into art departments, literature departments, cultural studies departments, architecture departments, and so forth. They actually didn't make their way initially into um, philosophy departments. Mm -hmm. Now these these are harder to uh, these are harder these are more like works of literature in a way. They're they're very dense. They're very hard to understand. There's a perform there's a strong performative aspect in these texts. So let me try to characterize it again. On the one hand, we have something that looks quasi-scientific. On the other hand, we have one that looks quasi-aesthetic and quasi-religious in nature. So these are kind of two styles of philosophy. And I would say I find both of them helpful in certain respects, but neither of which provided me with a home. Hmm. That's the key. So Ado comes around, he provides a quote-unquote third way of doing philosophy right at the moment when I'm finding myself dissatisfied in, in, key, in key parts with academia. So that's what I mean by the freshness. He begins to, su he suggests very strongly that philosophy, as it was understood in Greek antiquity, is a way of life, Greek and Roman antiquity. All these, philosophy was very close to what we now think of, uh, when we think of Buddhism or Taoism or um, any kind of Eastern practices. Now, I didn't know that at the time, because I wasn't really, uh, I didn't know about all these Eastern practices, but it's, it's key to understand that philosopher was a practitioner of sorts. This is someone who was practicing the art of living. This is someone who cared about living a wise life. And he did it, quote unquote, in a Sangha. That is, he did it in a community of fellow practitioners, whether at the Lyceum uh, or uh, around the Stoa or in the Epicurean commune of sorts. I'm sure you've read that. And, and, and what was a centerpiece here, uh, according to Addo, were these spiritual exercises, or what's mm. also called ascesis. He calls, in, in, in various places, he says, these are, these are exercises, or we might even call them meditations, whose point is not to inform us about a state of affairs, but to transform our way of being in the world. Sometimes he likes to riff on the inform and transform. Mm -hmm. So I was just, needless to say, blown away by this way of, of, this way of philosophizing. So that's where it comes into my life. If we first take Jane Austen as being interested in this moral education and a, kind of a, a different way of being academic of sorts or a bit different way of being studious, this one then ups the ante because it, it, it pitches it full, full bore into what it is to lead a, a wise life, a, a fundamentally um, open life, a vibrant life. Mm. And it, it, involves these, it involves all these different what we now call psychotechnologies or practices is well before his time here. The, the, the language, I mean, this would be an interesting study that the, or interesting paper to be written on. How it is the case that Ado is well before his time, 
because now in 2020 or so we're hearing things left and right about practice, practice this, practice that, cultivate mm-hmm. this, psychotechnologies, life ecologies, ecologies of practice, all, all, you know, he's writing about this well before th- that takes off. Mm. So this is what really struck me that philosophy is not something to just think about. But philosophy actually is something to live. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the thinking is in the service of the living. Mm-hmm. So it started to turn things 180 degrees around for me. As for the texts themselves, they, they all are um, different takes on different philosophers, whether it's Plotinus, who's more of a mystic, or whether it's Marcus Aurelius, who is uh, obviously a Stoic. They're all takes on the kinds of exercises, spiritual exercises they're involved in, in, in view of transforming their way of being with the whole. They're, 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 they, they are as uh, personal as they are cosmological. Mm. So it was, it was just, an, <laughs> it was just, it was incredible mm. at that moment in my life to have, what a, what a blessing it was to have found someone who was able to speak to me in my situation. Mm-hmm. It's what we'd say, you know, as, as John Rebecca would say, it's Kairos. It's, it's an opportune, apt moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's not, it's a kind of encounter that doesn't just, I, I have similar encounters in my history, in my past, it doesn't just come and give an answer to a question that we are asking, like, oh, what is the answer to this question? And then we get the answer yeah. with, a, with a book. It comes and it actually reveals the question too. Like we, we begin searching with a sense of it, an uneasiness that is itself not fully understood to us. And then we, we meet somebody or a book. Books are in some ways like people. Encountering yeah. a book is somewhat like encountering a person. And then it, the question is clear, clear uh, because of that. So I'm curious, how did Hado himself live? Was he a professional philosopher? Uh, yep. professor? Yeah, he was a very, very well-educated man. Mm. Uh, this is, you might say in today's light, a, a bit of a strike against him. He, yes, so he was, he, was, he was at the top French universities, and mm. he had some of the t- chop, and I don't know French universities well enough to, to, to go through the, the details about how, how that all worked, but I just know he was at just top universities, a top chair department. I think he may have replaced Foucault at one mm. university. Mm-hmm. So it's very, very learned. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very interesting to me that you presented him as a third way, not as a branch of continental philosophy. Because uh, in my own experience, when I read, when I compare analytic and continental, for me, continental is much more about life, much more about our decisions, much more about the self, about the person, what a person is, uh, what mm-hmm. the, the, not big questions, but more personally relevant. Uh, le- relevant to our life. Uh, so I would, well, I would probably naively include him in, in the continental camp. <laughs> so I'm curious why you opened up a third category. And what, what was it in the continental that was missing? Uh, or what, what did, was it that they had that was different from the Hado's path? Um, it depends on which continental philosophers are talking about. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think... Um, Suppose you're, well, I think a good paradigmatic example could be Jacques Derrida or mm-hmm. Gilles Deleuze. I think these mm-hmm. would be considered to be very important French philosophers mm-hmm. in the 20th century. Are you finding their clear, very clear writing that's lower, lower on the jargon scale? I mean, no, mm-hmm. if we're doing a checklist, you're not. Mm-hmm. Are you finding a uh, are you finding them answering questions that have to do with how you live? That's what the late Bernard Williams said of Socrates said, that's the Socratic question, how, how to live, how best to live. Mm-hmm. Is that the direct question they're asking? I mean, Deleuze is doing some pretty crazy postmodern philosophy. De, uh, Derrida is, is, some would say, more of a skeptical camp or reintroducing ancient skepticism. He's involved in, obviously, deconstructive practices of various kinds. It doesn't feel as you can really get your your paw, your big thick paw on it, mm-hmm. in a way that you can with Ado. Ado is anyone can read Ado. I mean, it's not always easy reading, but it's a lot easier than reading some of these very baroque texts. And I think you'd find that it speaks to you. So, mm-hmm. what do I mean by it? it speaks to you? I mean, there's something burning within you, and it provides you with as you said, a friend with whom you're speaking. Martha Nussbaum says quite nicely about certain works of literature and 
yes, certain works of literature, perhaps also philosophy, that they're friends. It's a friendship, a philia. So, so you, find you find yourself with a friend, even, a, dare I say, a guide, and he's, he's helping you to orient yourself toward the territory. I never had that experience. Even, and, and maybe our, our mutual friend, Johannes, would beg to differ with regard to Nietzsche, but I've never had the experience with Nietzsche, who, who's a little bit easier to read, with various 20th century philosophers. They had a kind of opacity that needed to be cracked. I felt as though I was still involved in sophisticated forms of exegesis, mm -hmm. literary analysis, just to make sense of the works at an intellectual level. Mm -hmm. Adele was the one who penetrated, he used the intellect, but for the sake, I would say, of the heart. Mm -hmm. Felt as though it was pen penetrating into me in, in a way that I think it has done since then for other people. Mm -hmm. so that's what I mean by a, a third way. He was, his basic question is how to live, I believe. And even if he goes in a fairly erudite direction, you can still feel that he's, that's, that's the question alive to him as it was for me. And I began to see that the, what I was reading was beginning to not just inform me, but also transform mm -hmm. how I was in the world. And it should be, it should be pointed out that when I was younger, I was a very arrogant man. Mm -hmm. I was an arrogant, self-righteous, uh, conceited. I don't want to overstate the point. Let's say I was <laughs> mildly yet persistently <laughs> arrogant and conceited. And it's through works like Jane Austen and above all through the, the reading of Ado and then going into philosophizing proper that there's been an extraordinary dispositional change. I don't speak as quickly as I used to. I don't presume. I'm, I'm not trying to give myself a pat on the backs here. I'm just trying to give you a, a sense of how formative these works what? were for me and how, how much if you'd see me, let's see. They were in 25, I'm now 41. If you could actually see the difference, you would see that these are like two different creatures. So these kinds of works, I think should be given a great deal of credit mm. for being the, 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 the catalysts for a kind of transformation mm. that allowed me to re-examine uh, myself in the light of them. Mm. Great, great. And actually based on reading that one chapter, um, I got the sense that he, uh, Ado himself, is not an arrogant person. He he never said that this is these are my original ideas. He relies a lot on other thinkers, mm -hmm. uh, the Epicureans. The, uh, he quotes Nietzsche, Goethe, uh, mm -hmm. and several other people in in, de, in in extensively. He relies on them. He has, and presents a very, them. He has a very gentle, limpid style of prose. It's mm -hmm. it's it's nice. It is learned, but there's a, a kind of humility there. Mm -hmm. An, an, an understatedness, mm -hmm. but most of generosity is just, okay, well, here are the, you know, I've collated, it's almost as if I'm just a collator, I've just collated all these views. Mm -hmm. If you read what is ancient philosophy, you'll find that, well, here, here they are, and I've, I've brought them to you in the form of a gift, and, and I'm not saying that I'm in any way original. And I think that's what I also appreciate about him. He's, he's, he's in some respects, in line with medieval, uh, medieval scholars who used to be involved in writing all these commentaries. Mm -hmm. They weren't trying to be original, they were just uh, trying to organize and make sense and, and make comprehensive and writing writing becomes a gift because I don't have to be I had a friend who wrote to me the other day and he's writing a book right now and he wanted to know my opinion he said that he's, he's not an academic he said I'm kind of concerned that it's not original enough I said, don't don't worry about originality just mm -hmm. just worry about at least two things one the aesthetic what do you love writing? do you actually enjoy writing it how is it hanging together? How is it fitting together? What is the prose like? Is it, is it, is it, is it a delight to read? Does mm -hmm. it taste good, we might say? Mm -hmm. There are aesthetic considerations of a very, a very personal sort. Then there are ethical considerations. Is this something that would actually help people? If I may use that word rather broadly here. Would it be good for people to read this? If it's just aesthetic, then maybe you just keep it, as, keep it for yourself. But if it actually has something of a, of a genuine ethical orientation, then yes, please, please bring it to the world. But those are the important questions to ask, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. when we think about when we think about our own writing and about others writing mm -hmm. the, the question is not so much is this going to be deeply original i don't i, I, I don't feel, i never get that feeling from Ado. Mm -hmm. he never said this is deeply original he's just i'm trying to reinterpret the tradition in a way that helps to make sense of something that we've obviously overlooked we've overlooked the fact that philosophy is a wisdom tradition mm -hmm. it cares about wisdom it doesn't it doesn't advance in the same way it doesn't have a progressive narrative in the same way uh, there is a, a thickness or a kind of perfume uh, or a kind of atmosphere that opens up for the one who begins to welcome wisdom into his life or her life. Mm -hmm. Things become, there's just a kind of a fullness that comes from the examined life. 
Mm. But, it just is, but it otherwise doesn't follow the same trajectory, uh, that of, of, of originality or original contribution or progress made. Right, right. Yeah. Based on what you said, my understanding is that what uh, sets him uh, apart from the continental tradition is uh, his way of regarding his readers, maybe, which, yeah. which itself comes from uh, the way he is handling the subject matter. Yes. It is less about um, like one of those giants, like, okay, now that you have read all the works of Marx, <laughs> and <laughs> now let me teach you their limitations. It's not that attitude. It's the attitude of yes. something. Yeah, yeah, it's also, I think that's a good point too. I have, it's been a while since I've read continental philosophy proper, I would say. But I think it also had a certain cleverness and archness and sure. criticality that is not, none of which is evident in his work. There's a, a simplicity, you know, mm. I think he calls his book on Plotinus the simplicity of being. I forget the name exactly. Um, just simplicity, a straightforwardness, and earnestness. And I think he's a little bit like I called him a guide before, but I could call him a host. Mm. He, he's a host in the old fashioned sense. I'm going to invite you into my house. I feel free to take a look around. Let's have a nice dinner together. Let's, let's enjoy our time together. Mm. You, feel, you feel welcomed when you read his, his, his books. At least I, I did. There was, it wasn't, wasn't as if you go to some of these uh, uh, bookstores in, in New York City that are really cool and they've got all this theoretical literature and you're not really quite sure if you've, you've met all your, your literary, your intelligentsia prereqs in order to go into the store. None of, none of the, I don't feel any of the, the posture and the pretense mm -hmm. or any, anything like that. Just as Nirvana says, come as you are. I like that mm -hmm. line quite a bit. It just come as you are. If you want to read the book, see what you can find. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, come as you are. That's the. It's I, in my impression is related to the the theme of this book uh, or the, the chapter version. Yeah. Uh, is it that the only the present, only the present, uh, is our happiness? So, yes, and in this respect, to you, in, in ways that have become clear to me in the decade. I guess 11 or 12 years since I originally met him, you might say, it's become clearer to me that he's, he's much closer. This will get us around to the third book when we come to it. He's much closer to these Eastern traditions that I would have initially anticipated. So uh, he thinks the Stoics, Epicureans, and others, um, yes, would, would say, come as you are. But then they'd say, hang on a second, just as we'd say with Buddhism, you can't end there because your, your ordinary stance, your ordinary way of being in the world is mistaken in certain ways. There needs to be a coming to a philosophical point of view. You know, Buddhism would say there's a difference between kind of an ego self and uh, emptiness or boundlessness. Most of them have, if I may put it somewhat dualistically just for the moment, most of them have some structure uh, according to which there's some kind of ordinary habits or your ordinary way of being in the world is where you start to be short, but you can't end there. So the philosophical path is, takes you from your ordinary stance to this uh, in this case a wise stance so the the the, the ascetic practices or the, the spiritual practices are meant to show you the difference now that brings us to the present so if you were to actually come to i guess a wise way of being then you'd realize that the present alone is our happiness you for example would have gone through exercises for them uh, in the east it would be meditations contemplations in christianity it could be called prayer in the proper sense these exercises would reveal to you that the, the, the future is nothing to be anxious about, in the very least. That would require, in the philosophical tradition, a great deal of clear thinking. And meditation doesn't require, or it's not quite so cognitive, but they are moving in the same, similar direction anyway. And it would also be clear to you that um, the way of being hung up in the past, or your understanding of the past, is also needs to be let go of. The present, once that happens, as is happening in this conversation, right? The present dilates. Present alone is our happiness. You don't have the cares and concerns. And during this conversation, we're not thinking about, uh, our minds are not going to the coronavirus and to the possibility that our family will die and that we care about our family, say, right? And they just did, if I, if I just be in virtue of mentioning it for a moment, but we come back to the conversation we're having. And it becomes very clear experientially that this is a kind of happiness. There's a fulfillment to be had in presencing and being fully present when, um, I'll try to give an example that, that, that may clarify things with people listening. When I philosophize with people, I have my eyes open or closed, typically not, not, not atypically they're closed. And 
I once had a, a Zen teacher who said, what are you doing? When I was just standing there in front before I was going to a one-on-one -on -one with her. She said, what are you doing? Uh, thinking? I said, no, you misunderstand philosophy. And I didn't go into it, but you misunderstand philosophy. The real philosophy, as you called it, means sitting in the present, responding to the other, possibly with a question that comes completely out of the silence. There is, there's no premeditation. There's no idea of a futurity. There's no idea of a past. These have been dropped. There's just the, the void or the nothingness, the silence, whatever word you want to use. This comes back to our last conversation, in fact. And then the voice, the speech emerges out of the silence. And the other person, if, if that person's present, because the person's waiting for, in some respects, alert for a question to arise, that person's mind is very quiet. Uh, it's, it's not going to be like a monkey mind because it's waiting for the question and the person doesn't know it's going to be a surprising question, whatever the question is. So in that kind of dynamic, the present alone is evidencing our mm -hmm. happiness, that it's just fulfillment, that it's, I like to use the word peace, actually. I think the word I, I, I prefer is peace to happiness mm -hmm. because happiness has a lot of different connotations, but there's an inner peace in the present mm -hmm. or rather not even in the present, that the present is peace, mm -hmm. the present alone, the present the fullness of the present is peaceful mm. and it cannot be otherwise. You can test it all you want to in terms of your meditations or contemplations or your cogitations, but it can't, the present alone, alone cannot be anything but peaceful. Mm. And yeah. so that's the, that's the, that would be the philosophical, that would be the journey, so to speak, in, in these works by Odo to, to realize that very, very simple insight. And in that respect, once again, it re resembles these Eastern traditions. The teachings are so simple, actually. Uh, our, our minds, our, our ordinary minds are very complex, but the teaching is very simple. If you want to just distill Otto's thought down to one line, you could say the present alone is our peace. The present alone is peace. Hmm. Then there's just all the exercises, perhaps, that seem to be necessary in order to bring one to the simplicity of that peace. Uh, in, in in our previous conversation, which is uh, recorded and it's uh, available for people to watch on your channel, uh, I had this experience. I I found myself uh, my my experience transforming through the conversation, and I I can describe it with uh, how I experienced the silences. The quality of the pauses changed from the beginning to the end. I found myself more and more uh, in peace whenever we had a moment of silence. And there was uh, no uh, sense of unrest. There was no sense of uneasiness until the very end where we had a long pause, which was completely uh, peaceful. And uh, there was also a, a discovery of, it is not the same pause. It is not the same silence. It is, uh, I think I found that a sense of richness with just being there, with just being in the conversation. And it was, it was a, there was an abundance in it. There was, uh, a silence of not, whenever we were silent, it was not because I felt, not because there's nothing to say, but there's just so much to say that it almost doesn't matter if I don't say any of it. And so that it was, and that even after we finished our conversation and we said goodbye, that sensation of the richness of, I think that Hado talks about it as uh, coding Gota, he says the healthiness of the instance. Mm -hmm. uh, the fullness or richness or healthiness is uh, that instance. Even until the next day, I still had access to that quality of experience, which I really exactly. enjoyed. And I think the practices uh, would be very, uh, what, would, uh, what would they enable is that easier access, more sustained access to them, to that kind of quality. Definitely. Experience. What should also be emphasized is that Initially, it comes to seem, so this is step one, if we're thinking about this together, it comes to seem as if silence is absence. That's our first misunderstanding. But we tend to think that the silence is, is a gap in speech mm. on the presumption that speech is primordial or primal and it comes first, mm -hmm. i.e., I don't have anything to say and I'm anxious about not having anything to say mm. or, or what have you. Okay, but then there's the experience, step two, of silence as fullness or plentitude as wanting or lacking nothing. That's, a, that's an amazing experience to have, and I'm sure we've all had it and then we've forgotten it. But if we just continue to remember it, then we come to step three, 
namely that there is, now we're getting into non-duality, really, there's no difference between silence and speech. There's no difference between the perfume of actual silence and speech. They're all silence, so to say. It's, silence drenches or saturates everything. When we're speaking now, and you're listening and you're about to speak, there is the distinct actuality that silence is, it's, it's, it's everywhere, right? It, it can't, it doesn't go away. It's not transient. So that's another way of saying the present alone is our peace. Mm. It doesn't matter ultimately whether speech arises or doesn't arise. It doesn't matter ultimately whether one is meditating in zazen you can't see my hands in this cosmic mudra, or this is a very Zen remark, or, or, or sweeping, uh, sweeping leaves. It doesn't matter ultimately because it's all the same perfume. It's all, it's, it's all the same stuff. The present can actually not leave us. Of course, it couldn't ever leave us, but it, it, we, we actually understand that it can't leave us, mm. regardless of circumstance. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing last step, you might say, because then, then you no longer get attached to, oh, I, and I've had this experience, oh, I must, I don't want to be around these people because they're so chatty and love. I just want to sink back into the silence, right? Which involves being over there on the mountaintop. You know, that was the second step. The third step is, oh, it's all the same perfume. It doesn't leave. It can't leave. <laughs> It doesn't matter whether the conversation, it's lovely when a conversation is deep and enriching and inspiring to be sure, but in some respect, it doesn't matter. There is no ontological difference. The present alone is our peace. Mm. Regardless. Uh, I get a sense that it is, uh, it's metaphorically, we can describe it as, we have a choice between four options, A, B, C, D. And uh, at first we feel like the distinction between choosing one, choosing B, for example, and not choosing anything at all, silence versus saying, speaking something. Mm -hmm. And what you describe at the end is that the choice doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one of the four we choose. It is- So long um, as you really experientially understand something. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) it's a direct realization, yes. Mm -hmm. And then that transforms the way we continue to talk, the way it that silence becomes not just something that is interrupted or broken. It is something that is actually continues to, to be there. And we yes, exactly. With it. Mm. And it also makes it easier to speak eloquently or not speak eloquently mm. or to be heard or not to be heard. One doesn't have to worry about being seen or wanting to be seen or not wanting to be seen. Mm. I like the line from the Tao Te Ching. Oh, we're already getting there. Okay. <laughs> I like the line from the Tao Te Ching and something like uh, the Taoist sage acts and then forgets it. Right, right. Uh, he acts, uh, according to one translation, the Taoist sage acts without possessing mm. and then forgets it. There's something very important here about, if we may use it figuratively, forgetfulness. Mm. Because it's in holding on to resentments or angers or any forms of shadows, baggage, how do people put it? As we're holding on, we are subject to the pain of memory mm. and the inability to, to actually fully experience that, that fullness, the fullness of the present, all pervasive silence. So the Taoist sage obviously deeply intuitively understands this. If there is acting, to do, then he acts and forgets it. If they're speaking to do, then he speaks and then forgets it. He doesn't relish, as, 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 as my wife lovely, lovingly puts it, he doesn't delight in his own person. There's no room for delighting in his own person, post facto. So there, there is therefore no fundamental choice. Whatever needs to happen, happens, and whatever doesn't need to happen, doesn't need to happen. Mm-hmm. That's the way, or the Tao. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, we are on the third book already. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I'm curious, could you uh, tell us a little bit about how you encountered this, this book? And what would people, because it is not a usual book, it is not a book to be read necessarily from beginning to end. And it is a book of, for me, I feel like it has, a, it is full of contradictions. It is uh, 
almost a book, as you say, psychotechnology that challenges uh, dichotomies because it says things like, oh, silence is uh, speech. <laughs> or, you know, it, it, it contains a lot of those, like something is something else, but those ordinarily we perceive them as com complete opposites. Mm -hmm. And uh, these statements, they actually, they, in a way they do make sense, but the way they make sense they, is that they don't make sense as a kind of flow they make sense as a kind of, um, I, I, I can use your word, as a kind of rupture. They make sense as interruptions in our mm -hmm. ordinary way of thinking. So uh, let me... Well, it's nice to know is that I've, so now from the autobiographical point of view, I'm now in New York and I first encounter this, this book through a conversation partner of mine who sends a copy of it to me and we reread it together. Mm -hmm. And I was just... Uh, really taken by the beauty of the text. That that that, that part should definitely be uh, be pointed to. It's, it's it's beautiful and it's mysterious. <laughs> so I kept reading it uh, from 2012, really largely up to 2015 or so. And it's so you're reading it in a way that you read Lectio Divina or divine reading. Pick it up. You might read it from cover to cover. That's fine. Or you might pick it up and you read one of the verses or one of the poems. And let it sink in and meditate on it. So it became that kind of book I would go to if I were if I were traveling. I would bring it with me. I would just open it up. I had I have one copy of, of the book in which there are different translations that I've copied out. So number thirty five. There are different different translations. And it wasn't the case that I was necessarily trying to think it through. So in this respect, we might even say this is not. How should I put this? It is philosophical, but it's not philosophical. You're not trying to think it through and iron iron things out. Mm -hmm. You're trying to let it sink into your being and see what happens. So it's in this respect that it is obviously a mystical text or a sacred text. This is this is clearly if we want to say Lao Tzu is a person, let's just keep it simple. Uh, then Lao Tzu is, uh, has a pretty amazing uh, mystical or spiritual understanding. He's realized his true nature. He's fully awakened and the book is a gift written in these in an enigmatic way and it's addressed not in the way modern books are to everyone but rather in the way that ancient books were namely to people who are initiated you might say so i would think it's for initiates as though people who've already had maybe some kind of taste to this they're on a slightly different wavelength or they're on a path or mm -hmm. they're on the way they, they have asked for it. <laughs> yes, they, exactly. Perfect. Yeah, they've asked, they've asked for it. And it has arrived. They've asked for it and it's arrived. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I, I, when, I, when I think of Eastern teachings, I think of them a little bit like seeds being planted. They're ruptures, yes. And at the same time, they're seedlings. Mm. A teacher says something to you that doesn't really make sense to the discriminating mind. But there's a way of sitting with it where it just sinks in. And then during meditation, some months or years later, something just makes sense at a different level, or it finally flowers. I should keep the metaphors clear. The seedling finally uh, grows, or maybe has been growing unbeknownst to you all this time, and it flowers. Mm. For example, I really can't paraphrase the Tao Te Ching for people. It's, it's obviously a mystical tract. It's also a political treatise in certain parts as well, or a ton of Taoist political treatise. I can't really easily tell you what it is, but I certainly can tell you what it's done. It's allowed me to become very clear about what the sensibility of the Taoist sage is. Mm. It, it's someone who's able to take it or leave it. And I don't mean that in the sense of apathy or indifference. It's someone who's able to ride life by the horns without being thrown off. It's, you could say it's someone, who's in, it's someone who's in the flow, or that's true as well. We could say it's someone who's not caught by preconceptions. That would be true as well. So, but it, it, we should also shouldn't uh, throw a lot too much in the realm of fluid metaphors, though water metaphors are important in this work. It's also the case that the person is willing to stand up for something if that's neat and appropriate too. It's the, that, so you can't even get attached, so to say, to fluid metaphors. If there's something that needs to be stood for, then the person's able to, to stand for it, but without the ego attachment. I, I, I seem to find that it pops up for me in philosophical conversations where I'll just kind of riff 
uh, whatever was going on, I kind of riff in Tao Te Ching in terms about mm. it. Some, something about it pops up mm. in that context, a line, a thought, a fragment, and it becomes clear why that is wise, why that is the teaching. And I think that's maybe that's the best way I would describe it. You read it often enough and then it just starts to pop up. Uh, it pops up in, in these fairly mysterious ways. And uh, do, do you see that you describe it as a kind of sensibility or you can say attitude? Yes. Do you see it as a unified sensibility or do you see it as, is it possible to see it as a collection of uh, family of sensibilities that maybe there are, they had, there are four seasons in it. There's a winter in it, there's a spring and summer and depending on uh, the circumstances, different sensibilities might arise. Is that, is yeah, that a possibility? That, 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 yes, that is a possibility. Mm. Thich Nhat Hanh says that Buddhists uh, drop the idea of taking a view, taking a position. Guanzo says, Guanzo, another Taoist philosopher, says those who argue miss the point, mm. which I think is great. And, and, and I, I have, I've always interpreted him to say that if you get involved in agonistic forms of conversation or in academic disputes, mm -hmm. you are, from his point of view, missing the point. So um, you can imagine these, these, these Taoist figures learning how to drop the, the, the stance which says I have to be right or I have to prove something or I need to get my word in edgewise or mm -hmm. yes, but. Mm. If you can just sit there in a conversation and not say yes, but, or oh yes, there's this thing, or, or whatever, mm -hmm. then you're getting, you're getting the sense that, that there's the, there very much could be an openness, therefore, to all kinds of sensibilities, provided that there is no uh, grasping, no uh, holding. Uh, holding or mm -hmm. burned by something or having to just get the last word mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or, or say, say your piece. Mm -hmm. uh, another version of the yes, but is uh, that I hear you say something, like a sentence or two sentences, and then I say, okay, just tell me, uh, explain yourself more, please. Just say more, say a lot more, until finally you say something that I already understand, and then I say, oh, now I finally get it. <laughs> As opposed to being willing to go away and think about it for, for a long time. For, well, first it soaks in. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit like, I, 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 I get what you're saying. It, it, we, this is the, 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 the downside of academic training. You're kind of waiting for things to make sense. Uh, I think the Tao Te Ching teaches you a kind of patience. And I don't, I don't mean patience is open. Uh, sorry, I don't mean patience means waiting. You're not at the doctor's office, patient, patiently waiting to have your teeth, the dentist always waiting to have your teeth cleaned. I define patience as just the letting be of things as they're unfolding. That is, that's the, the true patience. Whatever is happening is happening. And I, we have all the time in the world. That's what patience says mm. in the right context. It's not always, it's not always a virtue. As, as a, a, parenthetically, as Aquinas said, patience can be a vice. You can be unreasonably patient. But set that to the side. The ordinary case of virtue, of, 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 the, of the exercise of, of patience, is just letting things be as they are for as long as they need to go. So there's a, there's a certain way of being in which, and this is a, what I'm attempting to get around to, where things just kind of sink in without our having to understand. We even drop that. I don't have to understand. I don't have to, it's not that I'm not going to understand. And what's interesting about this, is the more that we just drop, I have to understand this. I should really think hard about this. You just drop it and let it sink, let it saturate then the more it, it actually is understood. There's a, there's a, there's a faith or a trust mm. that there doesn't need to be, there's an, Joseph Pieper really puts this well too when he talks about kind of a, 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 a medieval understanding of knowledge. Knowledge is apprehension. It's sort of like the, the, light, the light is received, so to speak. The modern view is very Kantian. I have to somehow work on it. To, to the point at which I get it. Mm. So uh, I love what the Tao Te Ching is. It's, just, it's, it's, it's suggesting that the ordinary discriminating mind can't make sense of this. This is also happens in Zen koans. The ordinary discriminating mind can't make sense of the question being presented to it. And that's okay. Mm. If the ordinary discriminating mind is to chew on it, that's fine, but it's never going to get there. 
just because of the way the question's posed. Mm -hmm. But there's a deeper level of what I would call the heart or heart mind that is, that is that to which felt understanding is always already available. So the, the, the metaphor that comes to mind is a little bit like oh, very slowly taking open, a, 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 opening up some, uh, turning the faucet and finding the water coming down onto a nice white, uh, nice white uh, washcloth. And you find that first of all, the washcloth's a bit stiff, but slowly it, 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 it takes, it, it receives, it opens up. You know, it unbinds itself, it becomes looser. And you can think of this as very Taoist, right? Taoist is, Taoist is very dancerly. It starts to, to soak it in. And then there's a point at which it becomes saturated. Forget about the, the analogy in which it keeps drenching the fabric. But that's, it's a little bit like that. You know, understanding is a bit like slowly taking in, allowing it to drench us, not really having to do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the first time it reminds me of the first time we spoke was in uh, 2016, I think. It was a group discussion yes. uh, where uh, Peter introduced us for the first time. And uh, you, in that conversation, you recommended us to read Tao Te Ching. And you, I you, forgot that. <laughs> your, recommendation, your recommendation was that uh, we focus on not getting it, but focus first on things like the musicality of it, the way, the way things sound, not... Uh, what each sentence means and how they are fitting together. And that's, that's another way of describing what you just described, to let something happen that uh, we don't fully understand how it is working, but it is, you're undergoing something as opposed to the Kantian laboring on something or work, working something, trying to transform it uh, into a lucid form, but instead letting ourselves be transformed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautifully put. Uh, how, how can one possibly, one could, but I think one would be, so to speak, mislaboring if one tried to understand the opening lines in the following way. The Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. Uh, with, without desire, uh, perceived mystery. With desire, perceived manifestation, and so on. You can parse that. I mean, another way of making another way of making the case would be to say you can you can do some parsing. There obviously is a lot of scholarship. You can find ways of disambiguating, disentangling. You could read secondary literature on it, but I think that would be missing the point. Yes, I'm not saying you should never read secondary literature. But it's wonderful and very very illuminating. But the point of the text is that it it touches you in some way, mm -hmm. and it doesn't necessarily touch you immediately either. That's what I think is wonderful about Eastern teachings. It's not always going to be, whoa, I can't believe the encounter I had with this particular teacher. As one teacher says, he's a disappointing teacher. There's something about what it's like to have met him and think, okay, that wasn't really much. And then two years later, oh. <laughs> I feel as though the Tao Te Ching is a little bit like that. It's very patient with us. If, if we just let it in, it will begin to, 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 to be this kind of magic. Mm. It's very interesting to me that you describe that you have this belief that I used to have, and I'm maybe not, I'm not sure about it anymore, that there are, in the first place, that there are sacred texts, that there are texts that are sacred. Uh, that, to me, is amazing. I, I, I want to believe that, to be honest, but I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if I do. Maybe it, it will take some time. Uh, could you say a, a few more words about what it means for a text to be sacred in general? Yeah, let's just imagine a scenario which, let's keep it simple. Let's imagine a scenario in which someone has meditated for 40 years. And that person is, I use understanding in, number, in a myriad, I use the word understanding in myriad ways, but let's say this person has an understanding that's very direct, very clear. This person has tasted reality, you might say, mm. as, as deeply as possible. Then let's suppose that the person were asked whether she could write something that would be that would as best as possible provide other adepts or d disciples or students or other people with some clues, some pointers, as they say in Eastern practices. Can you write something that provides them provides us with pointers? And she initially says, 
no, I don't, this is like the, the Buddha here almost. No, I don't know that I could. And then out of loving kindness and compassion, say, she says, yes, I will, I will do the best I can. I mean, knowing full well that the greatest meditation is silence. Mm-hmm. Ramana Maharshi once said that the purest form of meditation is just silence or stillness. Mm-hmm. So in that respect, he's going even farther than Pierre Ardo. He's saying there are no exercises to perform, no, no practices, no psychotechnologies. If you really understand the true nature of reality, that it's just opening yourself as completely as possible to peace or silence. Zen Master Dogen said that uh, meditation itself is peace. It's a direct quote. So she, so she, but she realizes that out of loving kindness and compassion, we might need something because we somehow don't believe that we're as it were there yet. So she writes this text and she's becoming clear about whether or not the statements are as um, true to her experience as possible, true to the experience of the nature of reality as possible. And she puts them forth. Now, what could happen here is that the, the text could first of all be given to her students and, and, and they would find them to be, if they do, they, they read them, they meditate first perhaps and they read them and there's a way in which certain lines speak to them. I found this to be true in my own experience. So that's, that's a form of sacred reading of sorts. There's something that the, the this is again, there's something that the, 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 the words are doing something, they're evoking something, they are they're creating a certain kind of understanding or atmosphere. But then let's imagine that there's a publishing arm of, of this organization, the Sangha, and they decide it would be really good to just proliferate this text and send it out to everyone. Who well, let's just you know, we'll do mass publishing here. And then something that's fine, and I think that's good so far as it goes, but something has been will have been lost for people because let's say let's say the teacher dies and the students are gone. It's, 40 years later and the text is still around. Someone picks it up without understanding that it's a sacred text and just tries to read it at an intellectual level and finds that there are contradictions or perplexities. Maybe this person has been schooled in certain formal aesthetics or certain certain forms of exegesis. The person really digs in and goes through the scholarship and disentangles things and finds, makes things coherent. That's all fine. But that, that person is missing the, the, the important part, namely that it came from someone who had experienced something and is bringing it forward to people. Mm-hmm. That's what's been lost in the Tao Te Ching and other, some of these other te- sacred texts, I believe. We, for, we forget that this is something that's meant to speak to someone who's already been existentially opened. So reading this in a college class is fine. Um, Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a good thing. But really, you, re, you come to the text because something in you has started to open up, even begun to blossom a little bit. And then you start, you realize that there's an esoteric, if I may put this in a positive way, esoteric quality to the text. Mm. And you accorded a certain kind of reverence. So you're, you're, it, it's not that everything makes sense or you have to believe in everything, but your skeptical mind then is dialed way down and uh, a certain openness or trust is, or charitableness, or I think the word reverence here is best actually, and the, the reverence is dialed way up. And then you start reading in a different way. It's not even what could this mean, but how, uh, how could this reorient me? What? What might, I, I'm not even saying you ask those questions necessarily, but how, how could this shift something in me? Mm-hmm. What would it mean if there is, what is, what is the perfume I've been using a lot? It's actually a re- reference to a Francis Cecile book um, called The Perfume of Eternity. I like the metaphor of perfume all of a sudden. There's a, there's a fragrance in the Tao Te Ching. You start to, you start to feel, you start to, to um, have, the, have the, the smell of that fragrance the more you read it. Mm-hmm. Wow, there's something about the nature of reality that's beautiful, astonishing, mysterious, and and okay. What 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 is that? And you, when I ask what is that, you're not trying to pin it down. The what is it is is just helping you to evoke more mm-hmm. what that's like. Mm-hmm. 
there's something that's like to go outside uh, after reading it and feel differently and not say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, why do I feel differently? Well, you just, you, you relax your being and things are clear to you. I remember after, uh, this, I remember um, early on when I was philosophizing people around, well, somewhat early on in 2012 or so, I was having all these very strange, well, at that then time, very interesting and strange uh, non-ordinary experiences during conversations, but especially after conversations. Lots of them. I would I'd go outside and run in Central Park and it feels like everything was sensuously saturated. My senses were heightened to an inordinate degree. Or I'd find that my body had changed. The, the, the feeling of what it was like to be embodied had changed. I felt sometimes as if my lungs were this were massive. I felt my eyes would dilate. I, uh, there were times I just had to close my eyes. It was just too much. I mean, and I, I didn't fight it. It was, they were all very interesting, but they were suggesting something. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What they're suggesting exactly would be hard to categorize, but the suggestion is that there's that, that these discourses, these sort of sacred discourses are, I can't find a verb. It's like operating. They're, they're, they're involved in something that our rational minds can't fathom, mm. but that our heart minds immediately get. And by get, I don't even mean like real in. I just mean self-evident and clear mm. and, and, and beyond doubt. Mm -hmm. But even that makes it sound a little bit Cartesian. I just, I mean, it's, it's, it's just things are at, at the same time, <laughs> absolutely unfathomable and very clear. So you can start to see how the, the Tao Te Ching might, might speak in paradoxes. Some things are com completely, completely unfathomable. And yet at the same time, it's clear. <laughs> hmm. I, I like the metaphor of the fragrance, and uh, it also reminds me of the, the sound, music, because uh, it is it indicates it is suggestive of something, something that exists or part of the world or a kind of world, and it's making itself known to us through sense of smell, and we become aware of it. It's kind of like the image that came to my mind was that moment in uh, C.S. Lewis Narnia, when Narnia becomes known, in the, ward the wardrobe opens. And like the fragrance of a totally different world and which makes its existence known to us. It's as part of existence that had already existed. Yes. At the same time, it is not fully revealed, but it's revealed as a, as a, as a starting point of further inquiry, further exploration. Like now mm -hmm. you, you are here and you can continue to exist here. Uh, is like a connection and if if i am connected to someone or to a place i don't need to completely always touch all parts of it i can just be in one part of it i can be a i can touch one corner of it and feel connected to all of it uh, so that me metaphor of smell as an as a beginning of it or a kind of beginning and as an introduction to it, yes. it uh, seems very appropriate another common metaphor used in let's say advice and taught to is veiling and unveiling so these stager texts could they can be partial unveilings. You think of a, a curtain that just is one of those old movie curtains that's just slightly opened, and you get a slight you get a slight opening in the curtain, but it's dark still behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. Still, you know that it's real, and something is as it were coming to you there. Mm -hmm. And and you know that this is not a different world. This is the same world but from a, bit, a fundamentally different vantage point or understanding or position or point of view. All those are metaphors, mm -hmm. uh, metaphors to be sure. The Tao Te Ching is not describing a different world. It's describing our world differently. Yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> You're here. welcome very much. Thank you very much for having me. Sure. It was a very enjoyable uh, conversation and I, I need to listen to it again. <laughs> so I'm glad <laughs> we recorded it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let me.